Next on Broadway Profiles, The Phantom Returns. We'll talk to the star of Phantom of the Opera on London's West End stage. Plus, Ethan Hawke is here to talk about his new novel, his hit TV series, and a new theatrical experience unlike anything you've seen before. And Office Space, we're on stage for the socially distant and safe return of live musical theater in New York City. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com. So glad you could be with us this week. I'm Tamsin Fidel. We're just a little over a month away from the return of Broadway musicals in New York City. But this week, Phantom of the Opera returns to London. Paul Wontora caught up with Lucy St. Louis. She plays Christine Daae on the West End stage. Where, where are your emotions right now? <laughs> They're off the scale right now. I'm literally here at the rehearsal studios because I've just finished for the day. Um, and I've literally just been learning Masquerade. And it is just amazing and i love that number specifically because everyone is a part of it and you get to hear the full ensemble and it is just electric is it safe to say that this was a dream role and this was maybe on your secret board this is more than a dream role this is something that i have loved this score from the moment i heard it when i was really young and it has lived through me through many years and I never thought really that it was ever possible but there was a part of me that hoped that it could be and now I'm just so grateful to be in this position because it is such a dream and I know especially being a woman of colour and I know that other women of colour have wanted this dream as well to be in this position and to show them we are able to be in this space there's something so powerful about seeing yourself or seeing someone who looks like you yeah. in a position of either storytelling or power or whatever or whatever it is, because then you know that you can do the same. So is it safe to assume that Andrew Lloyd Webber showed up at your concerts in like dark sunglasses <laughs> and a hat and was like, there she is, that's my next Christine Daae. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, no, I, I, I don't think that happened. <laughs> but, you know, I think, you know, the word got out. And, yeah. and I think the more people saw it, the more it opened up people's minds to an, yeah. another possibility. and. Yeah, it, it was, it's just very special. But you did uh, get to audition for him. What, what was the experience like of actually going in for this role officially? Oh gosh, well, my agent phoned me and said, okay, Andrew Lloyd Webber wants to meet you in person. And at the time I was cooking and he just said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm cooking. He was like, okay, just turn everything off and step back just for a minute because what I'm going to tell you is going to shock you. And nearly fell to the floor. And my husband uh, kind of, you know, came to me and was like, what's going on? What's going on? Is everything okay? And I was just in complete shock. And it was just, it was just amazing. I couldn't believe that in that moment, he wanted to meet me. So talk a little bit about the energy level uh, in the rehearsal room among your peers. What, what is it like right now? Oh, it is off the scale electric. Obviously, you know, everything is being safe, but the energy of just getting back into a room and being creative is something we've all been craving for so long. Tony and Emmy winner LaChance is heading back to Broadway this fall. She'll star in the Roundabout Theatre Company's production of Trouble in Mind. LaChance was last on Broadway in 2019 in A Christmas Carol. The year before that, she earned a Tony nomination for her performance in Summer, the Donna Summer musical. Trouble in the Mind begins performances October 29th. Ethan Hawke might just be the busiest man in show business. During the pandemic, he's released a hit TV series, a new novel, and a star-studded first-of-its-kind virtual theatrical production. His performance in Waiting for Godot is available online right now. We talked about that and a whole lot more. Take a look. Samuel Beckett, what a day to be talking about it. And Waiting for Godot, I feel like we really understand what that is all about these days, especially when it comes to Broadway. Boy, isn't that true? You know, I mean, I I never even imagined 
that Broadway could be dark for a year. If you had told me that even two years ago, I would think, what are you talking, I mean, it went dark for like one night on September 11th. What would possibly do that? When the pandemic first began, you know, I have four kids and I thought it would be really, you know, we were sitting around the house doing nothing all the time or trying to figure out things to do together. Right, right. You know, so I had this bright idea that we'd light a fire and we'd sit around the fire and, and read Waiting for Godot. Um, oh, wow. and, and we did. And it, it felt like a new play to me in this context. I mean, just listening to people talk about not being able to remember whether it's Saturday or Wednesday or Tuesday. And it stopped being absurdist mm -hmm. in this kind of goofy, let's make a existential point way and started to be ferocious. Like it, it started to be, you know, like something tactile. You know, we've seen a lot of virtual productions over the past year, obviously, and I've been fascinated to see what what people did to you know be creative or to feel something in all this but what you have going on with godot it's not a standard zoom camera but this is more a, a real theatrical experience meets film right you know it was one of those ideas that grew as we worked on it i've loved john legazamo for you know since i first moved to new york and i called him up and we started reading through the play and we we're like wow this is incredible like maybe this shouldn't be just a reading. What would happen? And there was something about talking to each other on Zoom that seemed to elevate. It was like, oh, you know, sometimes people set Hamlet on a spaceship or something and, and it right. you, you hear the play differently. Well, there was something about the loneliness and estrangement that the characters were feeling that seemed to be extremely alive. And then once we had it memorized and we're working on it, we started thinking it was really interesting. So we put better cameras in. And then this set designer, Derek McLean was like, let me build you guys a set. We got mailed a set to our apartment. And, and you know, I, I mean, listen to this. I had COVID, right? Oh, I, I had it. That. My wife and I had it and we had to build our set. I mean, I've never been so sick in my life and trying oh. to build this God <laughs> set. Uh, the more time we put into it, the more we started to believe in it. I think it, to us, it, it felt like fighting for the theater. All right, let's talk about your writing, uh, Bright Ray of Darkness. It is on my Audible. I've been listening to it. This is your first novel in 20 years. I, I love the fact that it has a fascinating look that most of us don't get to see of behind the scenes of, of a Broadway show, of how it's really put together. We see what happens afterwards, but we don't really see how it's all put together. So what gave you the idea to bring that to the world? I'm an old actor, but I'm still a young writer. You know, I, I haven't... I, I, I'm interested in writing and I'm, I'm a student of it. And I kind of felt, fell back on that first writing class rule of write what you know. Like if you, Don DeLillo or any fancy pants author out there would need to do, you know, 30 years of research about the theater to catch up with me. I mean, this is one area where I actually know something about it. And so that gives you an opportunity to perhaps offer something to the reader. The healing power of performance is something that's had incredible meaning in my life. And there's a lot of tabloid journalism about actors, mm -hmm. but there's not a very, there's not too many books you can find in the library that are fiction and a first account of the experience of what it means in a more substantive level to dedicate your life to performing. My name is Captain John Brown. John Brown, real life famous abolitionist leader. The show is incredible. It starts out with all of this is true. Most of it happened. For somebody that has not seen The Good Lord Bird, what does that mean? It means you have an unreliable narrator, you know? I mean, what we're, what, it's one of my favorite novels I've ever read by James McBride. And a lot of historical fiction pretends that it's the truth. And all of it has a point of view. We don't, the truth is so mysterious, you know? And the thing that I really love about McBride's writing is he owns the point of view. The whole story is being told by a 14 year old kid who is completely a bullshit artist, you, you know? <laughs> You've been reading the Bible. Not too much crap, but I've been thinking it's golly way. If we can work with that, you stand for the Lord. The Lord will stand for you. What I love about it is because it deals so 
completely and uh, beautifully about race in America and some of the sins and crimes in the DNA of this country, by dealing with it with such a sense of humor, it, it kind of knocks you to the left and lets you listen. McBride tells the story of John Brown a little bit the way Richard Pryor or Chris Rock or Red Fox might, you know? It's, it's incendiary and mercurial and you don't know what's gonna come out of his mouth. And in this age, we're all so worried about saying the right thing and doing the right thing all the time. It's just, it's a wave of honesty and love and silliness. And I hereby order you to get, get in his holy name. How do you summon John Brown's energy and fire with some of those speeches? Because they just go from here to here. I felt when I was playing that part that 30 years of acting was required. Every, playing Macbeth, Stoppard, Sam Shepard, all my experiences in the theater were required to play a character kind of of that quote unquote import. You know, I felt like I was playing a, it's like the first person who got to play King Lear or something. You know, I mean, sure. the challenge was so high. And it also required everything I knew about making movies because it was not a play, it was a movie. So it was, there's something very theatrical about the good Lord Bird. It's playful and wild and big and bold and works in big gestures and broad strokes. And, and, and yet it is cinema. This is Frederick Douglass. David Diggs real fast, just to see him there. Uh, you know, he famously played Lafayette and Jefferson and Hamilton. Now Frederick Douglass, uh, talk real quick about his performance. I was blown away by him. Obviously, every time I see him, I, I, this he has that wild energy of a star. You know? Yeah. He was doing a play at the public and I went to see it. The play was incredible, but my eye kept going like, oh my God, what if he played Frederick Douglass? And so, uh, oh. And so I went up to him afterwards and started courting him. Working alongside your daughter. Highlight of that? my life. Well, That's you know, great. watching kids grow up and watching them become themselves is really a powerful experience. I knew she was in trouble. She came to see me do the dress rehearsal of, I was doing The Winner's Tale. Sam Mendes was directing it at BAM and Rebecca Hall was in it. And Maya, I don't know how old she was, 11 or 12 or something. She watched the whole run through just hypnotized by Rebecca Hall, <laughs> you know? And when the run through was over, I said, listen, I'm gonna take you home now. We have a short break because we have to run through it again. You know, mm -hmm. she said, could I watch it again? Oh. <laughs> it's, a, it's a three hour Shakespeare play, you, you know? And she was 12. And I thought, you really want to watch it again? She's like, could I? So I was like, oh, you're done. You're so done. Perfect. We also had a chance to talk with two of Ethan's co-stars in Waiting for Godot, Tariq Trotter and Wally Shawn. What this represents is the launch of the new group Offstage, which is uh, this new venture. Um, and they're going to be, you know, creating theatrical expressions in different media. So this was uh, this one was about as different as as they come. And uh, I was really up for the challenge. It's a real movie. It's a film. It's sort of basically four different strange, dark dreamscapes. I personally think it's it's a very original interpretation, simply because of the intimacy with which it's done. I mean, it, we're all in close up through set design and, and editing and um, just, you know, being on, on the same page uh, creatively and performance wise, it gives you, I think the, the final product gives you the feel of us having been in the, in, the, in the same world. What an actor. The man has not made many, I mean, he hasn't been a professional actor, but he is extraordinary and, and, Everything he does is kind of beautiful. I mean, I suppose it's because he's a musician. And still ahead, welcome to Dunder Mifflin. Live musical theater returns to New York City. We're gonna take you to the return of The Office, a musical parody. This is Broadway Profiles, and we'll be right back.
A lot of people may not realize this, but not all Broadway musicals begin in New York City. They're actually born all across the country, all across North America and the world. Especially in places like La Jolla, California. You'll see a lot of seals and sea lions for sure. But that's also where shows like Come From Away, The Donna Summer Musical, and Broadway's latest upcoming hit, Diana the Musical, bowed pre-Broadway. We sent our cameras to Southern California to talk with Tony Award winner and artistic director of the La Jolla Playhouse, Christopher Ashley, to get an inside look at where some of Broadway's biggest shows got their start. There's a history of amazing artists working here who really make their home here, and we really try to keep those relationships going and be really loyal to them. Um, since the, the this theater was founded in the 40s, you know, like Gregory Peck and Dorothy McGuire and like amazing movie stars would spend their summers here. For 25 years under Des Mackinoff, like it was really vibrant home for new plays and classics. And I've been here 10 years now, and um, I'm really proud of the artists who have worked here. Come From Away started in a theater called The Podiker, which is a kind of very flexible 400 seat black box. Um, we're lucky enough to have four performance spaces. We've got uh, something called The Weiss, which is about 500 seat proscenium and very much on stage like a Broadway theater, width and depth and height. So basically if you build a show for The Weiss, um, it's pretty friendly to, for it to move on to New York if that's appropriate. And we have a three quarter round and then a couple of black boxes. So basically whatever kind of format you need uh, of a stage, we've got a theater that will suit it. I've always sort of been since being a pretty young adult, I've been pretty fascinated with La Jolla Playhouse. And there's something about the mix here of uh, new work, classic work, uh, adventurous work that I've always sort of loved. You know we're still weeks away from the reopening of Broadway, but live musical theater is already back in New York City with new safety precautions. Broadway.com correspondent Charlie Cooper is here with that story. The Office of Musical Parody is one of the first off-Broadway shows to return since the closing of theaters due to COVID-19. We spoke with the cast and crew about what audiences can expect and how they plan to keep them safe. The most interesting part for me is the fact that, of course, a woman is playing Michael. Oh, yeah. Um, talk to me about the opportunity for just anybody to um, audition for that role and why you guys made it that way. So when we started writing this, we said, how do we make this a parody? How do we parody? The Office is one of our favorite TV shows. And it felt like Michael Scott needed something to really add that layer of parody. And when we thought, let's have a woman do it, it made it all make sense. We're looking for somebody who can embody the character, but not necessarily, doesn't have to look like them, doesn't have to be the same type, race, anything. Yeah. So we do a full open call. Uh, really, we're looking for someone who has, I can't explain it, who embodies, embodies the, character, the character, brings their own uncomfortable silliness, awkwardness, funniness to it. So let's talk about Kelly Kapoor. How closely do you feel like you relate to her character? I relate to her immensely. Um, my family would say I'm a lot like her. I know there's a lot of the times now, even now I go home and I somehow end up just saying some of her lines not on purpose. So I do feel like I really pull into the Kelly character. You know, sometimes she thinks takes things a little too far, but that's what makes playing her so fun. There's no repercussions for it because it's just acting. The air quality in the theater is monitored 24 hours a day, and this air scrubber keeps the air clean for those coming in and out. I promise not to be too mean, but I need to make sure that everyone is wearing a mask. We have hand sanitizers added throughout the entire theater, um, both backstage and on stage. We've done a lot of social distancing uh, with where we're going to seat people in different pods with the group they came with and then six feet apart. And then the cast and the crew has also been all vaccinated in addition to the front of the house people. For those who are unsure about just being in a space where there are other people, what do you say to them and um, why should they come out to see the show? We say that come when you feel comfortable, right? Because we're taking all the steps. We feel safe doing this. Our actors feel safe, the crew. Everything feels safe and we're taking all the precautions but we want people to come when they're ready. All right, we'll be right back. Lin-Manuel Miranda's revolutionary hit musical, Hamilton, has audiences running to the Richard Rogers Theater for a hip-hop history lesson. I'm past, patiently waiting, I'm passionately smashing every expectation, every action's an act of creation. The musical offers insight into the life of Alexander Hamilton, his effect on the United States of America, and his relationships with Aaron Burr, George Washington, and many more historical power players. 
Whether you're a history junkie or not, Hamilton will suck you into one founding father's story with its crazy catchy score, stunning choreography, and inspirational message that anyone can make a mark on history if they're scrappy and hungry enough. Get information and tickets for Hamilton and other shows lighting up Broadway at broadway.com. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is Broadway Profiles, presented by Broadway.com.